This is the 5 a.m. Miracle, episode number 504. Ditch your regret, tap your potential, and achieve your goals with John Acuff. Good morning, and welcome to the 5 a.m. Miracle. I am Jeff Sanders, and this is the podcast dedicated to dominating your day before breakfast. My goal is to help you bounce out of bed with enthusiasm, create powerful, lifelong habits, and tackle your grandest goals with extraordinary energy. In the episode this week, I speak with John Acuff. John is a keynote speaker, prolific author, host of the All It Takes is a Goal podcast, and one of my favorite people here in Nashville. John was on the podcast a few years ago, in episode number 223, discussing his previous book, Finish, and this week, he is back to discuss his latest book, All It Takes is a Goal, the three-step plan to ditch regret and tap into your massive potential. Let's dig in. And I'm back here in the 5A Miracle Studios with my favorite guest on this podcast, Mr. John Acuff. Welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me again. I really appreciate that. It's been a long time since uh, I've chatted with you, but I think that one thing that has been consistent uh, with you has been producing amazing books. And your latest one, I think, fits this podcast uh, so well. Uh, It's called All It Takes is a Goal, the three-step plan to ditch regret and tap into your massive potential. This is the kind of book that I should have written myself. (laughs) I'm glad you did, so thank you. Uh, oh, that's funny. But beyond that, what I want to there's, there's one concept in this book that caught me right away that I think is probably like the thing I want to lean on at least to begin, which is this word potential. Because I think that what I've thought about for a long time when it comes to books, uh, not necessarily goal books, but when it comes to like people like you and I who create content, we share it with the world like, hey, you could reach your potential and be all you can be. I, I say these words, I hear these words, but I kind of wonder like from your perspective. What does that mean, the practical sense of what are we striving to become? Like, what is this kind of ethereal, like, land of awesomeness that we're trying to get to? Yeah, so the way I define potential is potential is the gap between your vision and your reality. So the vision you have for how life can be and the vision and the reality of how it is currently. So I think when you tap into your potential, what you're doing is you're closing that gap. Like, you're overlapping those two things. So an example that might be, okay, I want to you know, be in a certain shape or I want to own a certain type of house or I want to build a business. And you've got this big vision for it. And then the more you work, the closer you get that reality to overlapping that vision. That's when you're really tapping into your potential. When you're saying, okay, I want to run my own business and I'm running my own business on the weekends right now. I have a day job. It's still paying all my bills, but I'm starting to kind of get that reality closer to the vision of what I want my life to be. That's how I think about about potential. It's just this gap between who you think you can be and who you are right now. And then if we can make those overlap, that's where life gets really fun. I know from reading a bit of your book and and a bit about what you've discussed here that you didn't feel like you hit your potential until later in life. Can you share more about that? Oh, yeah. Like still currently am finding different ways to tap in. No, I was, I wouldn't say I really started to get excited about goals and understand goals and potential until I was in my mid thirties. And I would hear all these stories of like, this guy had a paper route at four and he's an entrepreneur (laughs) and like all these people that seem to know exactly what they wanted to do with their life, like right out of the womb. And I just would feel like frustrated, ashamed of my own life you know, like I was wasting potential. So that's really where this book started. We took our oldest daughter to tour um, Sanford University in Birmingham, Alabama. I went there, my wife went there and we're standing on campus this is a couple of years ago. And my wife says, wasn't college the best? It was just so amazing. And I was having the opposite experience. I was looking across like my collegiate train wreck and just thinking, oh, what a waste. Like I could have done so much more. And on the drive home to Nashville, I started to think about that. And because I had just written this book called Soundtracks About Mindset, I knew those thoughts weren't helpful. That regret, the way I was processing it, wasn't helpful. So I started to think, okay, the four years of college weren't weren't great, but I've got 40 years that I'm still going to live. Like, what if I could make those great? What if I could figure out how to tap into my potential? And then I started to say, do other people feel like they're not living up to their potential? And I was 
amazed how many other people felt that way. We, we commissioned a research study with this PhD named Mike Peasley. He's a professor at MTSU. And we asked 3,000 people if they feel like they're living up to their potential and 96% said no. And so then mm. I had the two, there's, there's three things I look for in a book, Jeff. I look for a personal connection because I want the content to be authentic. I want it to be something I'm excited about. I'm going to talk about it for years. I need to be all in. The second thing I look for is a need. Do people need it? Do I hear neighbors talking about it? Corporate events, when I speak to them, are they talking about it? When I do surveys and studies, are people asking for it? And then I look for a spot in the marketplace. Has it already been done to death in the marketplace? And so I felt like I had the two things. And then when we went into the marketplace, I was surprised how many people talked about potential from a like holistic, like ethereal kind of way, but not a tactical, what do I do with that on a Tuesday? We've all been to events where some speaker motivates us, but it's so disconnected from our reality that you, by the time you get to your car, you're like, that was exciting, but I don't know what to do with that on a Tuesday. <laughs> like, what do I, like, how do I actually make that a goal? So that's where the book started from is, is that sense of, no, I didn't until I was my mid thirties, I didn't understand goals. And then really until my mid forties, when I st started working on this book, did I realize, wow, there's more that I can do. There's a whole lot more I can do. Like, the thing I'm excited about right now, I'm 47, is like, I want to have a dope 60s. I'm going to have an amazing <laughs> 60s. Like, and I'm working on a plan right now. Like, and I'm the phrase I put in the book and I say all the time in my own life is, I was late to my 30s. I'm going to be early to my 60s. Like, I rolled into my mm. 30s, one wheel busted, engine on fire, car was smoking, no plan. And like, I'm not hitting my 60s that way. So at 47, I'm deliberately thinking, what are the things I can do now over time? Not a, not crazy, but over time that set me up for success at that stage of my life. Well, that's an interesting thought because I was just talking to my wife recently, a, a similar concept of, you know, my parents had kids, me and my brother uh, in their mid twenties and my wife and I didn't have kids until our mid thirties. And I felt like in a lot of ways, I didn't kind of become an adult until then. Like I was like a decade late. Right, that's what oh, I've, yeah. I've had that yeah. feeling for for a long time that I'm like yeah. I'm late to the party, and I feel like totally. in a lot of ways like that's it, that re revelation of like okay I'm an adult now I have kids now I'm like I'm I'm a person now who should do things on purpose, but you know, to the point of your you know being practical the nuts and bolts of what it means like what does that mean for you in terms of how you approach goals today versus how you used to like is there like a specific vision for you to say to make this practical here's what I do. Oh yeah. So I'll give you one example. So, um, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I would have had a wild, huge goal disconnected from reality, divorced mm. from my calendar. I always say that time is the only honest metric. So if I go, Jeff, like my kids matter more to me than anything. And then you go, well, let's look at your calendar and I'm not spending any time with them. Then they don't really matter. If I say health is an important goal and you go, okay, well, like how many hours a week are you walking or exercising or whatever? And, and it's none, it's not a really important goal. So I think a lot of times when I was younger, I would dream and go, I'm going to have a vision board. I'm <laughs> going to have like a gigantic dream, go big or go home. And now what I know is a 47 year old who's coached tens of thousands of people in real goals is that you've got to make friends with your calendar. Like I, I meet people all the time that I'll say, tell me your goals and I'll have 10 goals. And I'll say, Okay, great. Let's just do a quick hours update. Like these goals to do them successfully would require about 30 hours of free time a week. Do you currently have 30 hours of free time a week? Is that what you're doing? Like right now, that's one of your big issues. You've got, you know, four hours a day where you're like, oh, I've got so much free time. Nobody has that. So I now go, okay, how do we do that over time in a sustainable way where it's still exciting? You don't wait on motivation to always lift you. Like you bring your own BYOM, you bring your own motivation, you make small changes over time. The me 20 years ago couldn't be releasing his ninth book this week. Like the mm. me 20 years ago couldn't be turning in my 10th book this month. Like I have another book due to the publisher this month. So I look now at that and go, okay, now that I've learned some things, I'm able to really enjoy life, really lean into goals in a way where I actually accomplish them.
It's interesting with the idea of being aspirational when you're younger. I've had you know a lot of bucket list goals of all these like here are the big things I want to do, and I still have those lists today. Like I, I held on to them, but I, I've reviewed them in the last couple of years, and I just kind of chuckle because it's like, okay, that was nice, like like what a good thought, but none of these things are actually real. Some of them have been real, which is true, but the majority of them are not. I feel like to your point about the 30 hours of free time per week, how do you go about kind of whittling it down to say, okay, I've got 10 bucket list goals. I want to make my life go somewhere. Like, do you get to a point where you say, I'm just going to pick one and like be all about that one thing? Or is it multiple goals you do slowly over time? Like, how do you yeah, approach the great question. What, to, what to choose? Great question. Um, I think it's different for different people, but I've never been the kind of guy that can go all in on one goal because I have mm. these things called kids. <laughs> um, I have this other person in my life called a wife. And so like, I see sometimes you'll see like a young entrepreneur at 23 who's like, I work 90 hours a week and I sleep at the office. I'm like, all right, fine. That's fine. Like if that's your life and you're not going to burn out, fine. That's not my life. That's mm. not how, that's not how this works. So what I like to do is I'm fine with you having as many goals as possible if you're able to give them time and if they're not competing. So competing goals would be if I said to you, Jeff, my goal this year is to do 150 speaking engagements. And my second goal is to be a better dad and husband. You would go, <laughs> oh, dude, I don't know how to tell you this. Those are in competition. Like if you're gone 250 nights a year, you don't know your kids. That's just math. Mm. That's not, that's just math, dude. So for me, I like to have a handful of goals at any given moment, but they're not competing. So I've got, you know, I, in the book, I talk about kind of the, the five games I think about life in. I think about finances. I think about relationships. I think about career. I think about health and I think about fun. So I try to have some goals in each of those categories at any given time where I'm saying, okay, like I know, fun, I love to read books. So one of my goals this year is to read 66 books. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm tracking that with Goodreads. So I have a tool, I have a number, I have progress, I'm charting it, et cetera. So that's a fun goal. Health goal, I want to run 450 miles this year. So I, I know Strava is tracking that with me. I know how many miles I've done. Um, relationship goal, like I'm starting to say yes to more relationships where I'm saying I tend to be an introvert. Um, people think I'm a, a, an extrovert because I'm a public speaker. But what they don't realize is that public speaking is one of the most introverted activities you can do in public. Because mm. I'm the only one with a mic. It's not a conversation. <laughs> I control that entire moment. If you're in a panel and you're talking, that's more extroversion. But an introverted moment is public speaking. Like it's one mic. I know what I'm going to say. I'm the only one talking. Like that's introverted. So I'm trying to become more extroverted. So I have some relationship goals. So I always have a number of goals I'm working on at the same time because my life is too um, too messy and complicated for me to go, Jeff, I'm only going to train for a triathlon and I'm going to ignore everything else. I don't think that's healthy. It's definitely not healthy for me. I, I mm. never forget. I, I saw a woman with a sign in a triathlon in the crowd and it said, if you didn't get divorced, you didn't train hard enough. Ooh. And I was like, oof, that is <laughs> rough. And like, no, thank you. So I always have multiple goals going on at the same time because I have a multiple faceted life. And I think most people do too. Well, I think to that point, I mean, one thing that I, I'm kind of a through line I'm seeing already with what you're talking about here, the, the idea of math, of calculating, kind of do I have time, uh, the number of books you want to read per year, like miles to run. To me, like the numbers aspect is a big part of this. It's it, a calculation, right? You were like analytically Dude, 100%, asking, like how 100%. do we get here? Which, which I think Dude, is fantastic because that makes it so direct. It's like, can I do this? Well, here's the answer, yes or no, which I love. Yeah, and people don't like that initially, and I understand why, because it introduces the concept of limits, and we hate limits. Mm. We reject limits, but I, I look at limits as – as springboards, as boundaries, as something, they, they kind of clarify the picture for me, not as a, oh, I'm so mad I can't do all this. Just, okay, if I run into a limit, what can I do to change it? So I, I did an exercise. This is so simple. I did, it's called a time gap analysis where I said, okay, I have 168 hours um, this week. Let me add up my work and my personal commitments. So what of my hours already have a name? So I've got a, this meeting, that meeting, I'm going to take my kid to cross country, like add it all up added it a percentage of unexpected hours because about 20% of my week, just completely unexpected. No week ever goes according to exact plan. And I had 171 hours of commitments in a 160 hour week, which is a problem. 
I'm three hours over. So then I said, let me try this for three quarters of a year because this was in March when I did this exercise. I added it all up, came up with everything that I was working on, and I was 520 hours over budget, mm. which is 13 weeks of time over budget, 13, like 40, 40 hour work weeks over time. That's a significant issue. But now that I know that, I can do something about it. I can, you know, delegate, I can delay, I can delete things, I can start to do it. Most people never make friends with their time and never make friends with their calendar. So then it's just this force that constantly stresses them out. The reason you feel out of time is you are out of time, like Mm. you are. And then here's the interesting thing, Jeff, that happened in 2020, 2021, a lot of people had to pause their normal life, their normal work and do different things. COVID forced them to pivot. We said that word a thousand times, pivot and do new things. And then what's happened is the old things have come back in 2023 and they didn't stop doing the new things. So there's a lot of people working double jobs right now who Mm. pivoted and took on 40 new hours of work to kind of keep the thing going. And then at least 75% of the old things have come back and now they're way over budget and they don't know why they feel so stressed. And they feel so stressed because they have two jobs and didn't even notice. Hmm. Wow. That makes total sense. <laughs> I think for me, I, I my, my COVID experience is a lot of, I let a lot of things go and I didn't bring them back. And so it's kind of the opposite in a lot of ways. I'm doing less now than ever before, uh, which- Well, me, but for me, like all my live events got canceled. So I took on virtual events, classes, mm, podcasts, all these yes. things. Guess what's come back? Live events. Right. So- all the things I pivoted to, I'm still doing and I still have live events. And so there's there's a lot of companies that, okay, they're going to do virtual work. They're going to like retail stores. I, I've spoken to many retail stores that had to figure out great curbside delivery. So they had to add that. Mm. And now regular restaurant eating has come back. And so now they're juggling. We've got to also work like the DoorDash thing. We got to do all like 17 other ways for people to get food plus the normal way which five years ago was still busy. We were busy then, and now we've got 17 other ways food leaves this building, and we haven't acknowledged that, whoa, we've got a lot going on. I mean, from that perspective, I mean, the book is called All It Takes is a Goal, and I think that for a lot of people, myself included years ago, might hear like what you're just talking about of overwhelm, of I have too much on my plate. When someone is in that place of like, there is just too much going on, do, is there a, a plan to scale back in a way that is intelligent and healthy uh, and fulfilling? Because to get to the place you're talking about of, I'm excited for my goals, I'm excited to work on these things. Excitement is hard, is a hard feeling to have when you're just drained. And it's like, how, yes. how do you pivot those things? Or balance those well, so a big a big part of it is being kind to yourself. One of the soundtracks I say, and soundtracks just for my phrase for repetitive thought, is the harder it gets, the kinder I talk. The harder it gets, mm. the kinder I talk to myself. And a lot of times people do the opposite, and it just doesn't work. Like they they try to say to your, themselves, "You got to get your act together," and they talk worse. And so part of it is kindness. So. I, you know, for example, when I had two kids under the age of three, I had less available writing time. That was just a reality. Like it was just, I remember my wife said one Saturday morning, I was like, I'm going to go do some writing when the kids take a nap. And she was like, oh, they dropped their nap. And I was like, what? (laughs) Did we get the vote on that? What do you mean they dropped the nap? And I remember being like, oh, I guess I just lost that hour and a half. And so it's different when you've got, say you've got a bunch of kids at a certain age you shouldn't hold yourself to the standard of when you didn't have kids and go, boy, I used to get so much more done. Now I feel overwhelmed. There's just different seasons in life where you have more time for more things and other times when you have less time for things. And so I think you have to, one, be kind to yourself, two, acknowledge what season you're in, and three, start to put some numbers around it so that you can have some reality around it so that you can start to make some decisions. It's only confusing when it's all in your head. When it's all in your head, it's chaotic, it's overwhelming. One of the things I like to say is that paper shrinks fear. Paper shrinks fear. So if you said to me, John, I have a hundred things to do, I'd go, oh man, that sounds like a ton. Like maybe, maybe you do like, let's list them. Let's, let's list them out on this piece of paper. And chances are you wouldn't have a hundred. We could probably categorize some. We could probably even say, hey, you're carrying the pressure of this one. This one's not due for a month. Let's move. This guy belongs in October. What is, why is he sneaking into <laughs> September for? Like, this isn't the, you know, this isn't time for that. It's kind of, you don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. Um, you know, I think that's part of what happens. And so the reason I like numbers, and I'm a writer, so it's not like I'm great at math or anything. It's just, 
I have this phrase I say that data kills denial, which prevents disaster. Data kills denial, which prevents disaster. I know I'd rather know the data and deal with it than have the disaster eventually. And I'd rather say, oh, okay, I want to write a book. The book is due in six months. So that really means if I don't want to be a jerk to the me four months from now, like I don't want to, I'm always thinking about how do I hook up future me? What is future me? How do I make today? Like, what do I do today that makes tomorrow easier? Oh man, if that book's coming due in six months and I don't want to wait till the fourth month because that would really stress me out those last two months, I should try to deliberately write an hour a day, four days a week. Not every day. I'm not going to be perfect, but what can I do to set that up? So I think there's all these little tools when you feel overwhelmed that you can start to say, okay, let me pull back. And then the other thing, like the stats, I mean, according to Happier Money, this book I just read, the average American watches 40, uh, the equivalent of two months of television a year, two solid months worth of TV a year. The average American, according to Nielsen ratings, watches 34 hours of TV a week. So I agree people are busy, but I think there's also time we're missing that if we said, you know what, I was on Instagram seven hours last week and I felt gross after I was using it. Maybe I only need to do it three and a half. Like I, you know, inside the book, one of the stories is Susan Robertson. She got her college degree in the car rider pickup line by picking up her kids and doing 15 minutes here, 20 minutes there, 30 minutes there, and just realized, oh, I'm sitting in this line and I'm scrolling Instagram, or I could be watching a clip from a professor at a local community college that will help me towards my degree. So I think be kind to yourself and then make friends with numbers and then steal your time back from places that are stealing it. Hmm. So much there. I love that. You know, yeah, it was a long answer. I no, like that's talk, fantastic. Really. When the whole the, the Instagram thing you just mentioned, uh, one thing that I tried I think last December, I deleted all the social apps from my phone and I never reinstalled them. So I'm still like what six months into this with no social apps and just you're still alive. And You're I'm still, still alive. I, I have oh not died. Um, I oh still look at it on my computer occasionally, but like it's it's become such less of a thing, which to me was this highlight not of social media, but more of what I give my attention to is what my life is. And I don't want my life to be social media. And so it was just this question for me of like, what do, what should my life be about? You know, I've got two girls that are under the age of five right now. Like to your point earlier of the season of life, it's, it's busy. It's like I'm in that season and have been for the last couple of years. And it's I know for me now to define what a goal would be, to define what my life would be. I have to be a lot more intentional now than before. And it's it's a big mental shift and one that I'm constantly trying to reevaluate. But I like this idea of here's what my life is, like map it out. And then here's how I'm going to change it to not be the things I don't like anymore. Well, yeah. And something I say sometimes is that time is your most valuable resource, but it's also your most vulnerable. It's your Mm. most valuable and most vulnerable because time doesn't know how to protect itself. Time only knows how to flow. You have to protect it. So for me, the the more I spend time invested in goals, the the more serious I get about my time. And what's fun is that, like, I don't mean that from a discipline or grit or like persistence perspective. I have very little discipline. I have very little grit. I have very little persistence. What I do have are goals I love. So the joy mm-hmm. of doing it makes other stuff look dumb. Like, find yeah. something you love doing so much that other stuff is like, this is dumb. Like, Netflix is dumb to me. Like, why would I like? It's not, and it, again, I'll watch TV with my wife at night. It's not that I'm anti TV. It's just if I have the chance to do something that moves my business forward or my family forward or my health forward, like, let's go. Like, that's awesome. It's not that I woke up at 2 a.m. one day and was like Mark Wahlberg and was like, I'm just going to be disciplined today. No, I just, I got a taste of something better and I want more of that. So the first book I ever wrote, I wrote, I had a full time job. I had two kids under age of three. I had freelance clients. I had an Atlanta commute. I had no time, but I started to carve out time in the morning, which is not fun to hear, but it's, that's just what I did. And then I started to watch less TV, but, and I didn't watch less TV because I was being disciplined. I watched it less because I was like, Ooh, if I turn this off. I get to write some more. That's pretty cool. Like I get mm. like, so I get to, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. And so that for me is a big part of it is finding something you really enjoy. And then once you do, you can't wait to throw more time at it. Like you throw more time because it's fuel you're throwing at the thing and you get to watch it grow. That's really fun. That is really fun. I think 
for me, I've thought of this concept of it's more of a, of a magnet. Like it's pulling me in. Like I feel like oh, yeah. I have to yeah. go towards it because it's just like drawing me to, you know, totally. towards it. Which I totally. feel like for me, if that's the feeling, I feel pulled into something. It's the opposite of being like forced into it. I'm not being pushed towards it. Like it's not, not the discipline. It really is this like I can't not do it. Like I have to because I want to. And that, that's what my life is now. And I to oh, get yeah. to that point for me is like in those moments. It's amazing. Like life is fantastic. That's flow. It feels like flow. That is yeah, flow. Totally. Yes. Totally. Yeah. Hundred percent. So on the book, you also have mentioned this this topic or this concept of looking backwards to help us go forwards. I want, I want to hear more about that one. Yeah. So that was probably the biggest surprise for me in the writing process was um, there's all this research that for every 100 scientific studies we do on sadness, we only do one on joy, mm. and we are obsessed with trauma from our past and pain, but we very rarely look at the good moments. Like every, every counseling session I've been to, like I remember one, we drew a trauma egg where you had to draw a picture of all the traumatic things from your past to your present. Every marriage couples group I've been in, the first couple of weeks we share our stories and they're these dramatic, terrible parts of our stories. I've never had somebody say, hey, we're going to look back at the last 10 years and figure out what really worked well for you as if joy has nothing to teach us. So one afternoon in the Augusta airport, I felt stuck about my potential. So I just wrote best moments on a top of a piece of paper and I started to list them out. And what I thought would be 10 moments or 20 moments turned into 171 different moments. And number one, it taught me gratitude. We always talk about gratitude is valuable and it is, but how do you do it? This taught me gratitude. Two, it taught me self-awareness because it reminded me of the things I love Three, it made me present because when you tell your brain and your heart to look for moments you love in the past, it automatically starts looking for them in the present. You start to go, oh, I should add this to my list even while you're still in the moment. And then it set me up for the kind of future I want because what happens when you do a best moments list and it's chapter two of the book is you automatically have this response where you say, I want more of this. You see, the problem with goal setting is we often go, you need to come up with a 10-year vision, a 20-year vision. And that's overwhelming to me. Like that, mm. I, I've never been good at that exercise. I always feel like, what am I supposed to dream about? How do I know it'll happen 10 years? How do I know it'll happen 20 years? And it's just this huge vision wall. This is the reverse. Instead of saying fantasize or try to guess at the last 20 years, review the last 10, what lit you up? And let's go figure out how to put more of that into your Monday, more of that into your next month, more of that into your next year. And so it's kind of like, finding all the ingredients for all your favorite meals and then realizing you can make them again. And it becomes this really fun moment. So that's what a best moments list is. And it's kind of, it ends up being the opposite of a lot of approaches. But when I tested it with people, I would say, okay, we're going to come up with 30. I want you to come up with 30. And they would come up with 300 and they would mm. go, once I started, I couldn't stop. And it all of a sudden you have these reunion moments where you go, I used to love this. Why did I stop this? Like what happened? <laughs> like where did life get? And then again, you start to plan them in the future. So it redeems your past, it informs your present and it prepares your future. And so it became this really fun life planning tool that kind of kicked off the book. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of potential for that in terms of, as from my perspective, I've thought of this as amplifying my own success or looking at the things that are working and doing more of those things. Which I think to your point, it's like if you look back and find things that have worked well, it's really about it's bringing it back, but in a new way. Right. Like, I, for example, like I used to run marathons a lot and then I had kids and I stopped. And so for, for me, I know there's a lot of joy that I get from that. And so I've, I'm bringing it back in a new way, a way with children now. But it's it to me that like, that's a refreshing way to say, like, I can still be like the me that I want to be in my current life, which I think for a long time I had a mental block of saying I can't because and I, I don't yeah. like thinking that way. <laughs> so it's, it's a big shift to be able to, to bring those things back uh, into the present. Well, let's see the new version. Let's see what the new version looks like. So right. that's where perfectionism gets knocked down because you go, I can't do it perfectly like I used to. And you go, no, 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 no. But I could walk around the neighborhood. I could right. sign my daughter and I up for a, five, a 1K fun run at Thanksgiving. Awesome. Like there's other ways to do it. And so, yeah, it's the tool. It's a sneaky good tool. It's one of those... Where I like, I looked at soundtracks, the book that I wrote before this, the mindset one is it was a heart book disguised as a head book mm. because you read it and you're like, I'm going to be 
build a winning mindset. And then you go, Oh, this is getting heart stuff is coming out of this idea of how I talk to myself. And so I feel like this is in every book. I try to have like a Trojan horse idea that on the outside looks simple, but in the inside has a lot to teach us. And I think the best moments list is that tool. Mm, I love that. John, this is amazing. I think this book is going to be a phenomenal tool for a lot of people, especially those listening to this podcast right now. And so of course I want them to get a copy of it. So tell us more uh, about that. Yeah, so this is the day before it comes out. So you've still got time for what I think is the coolest promotion we've ever done, which is if you pre-order the book, you can get the entire audiobook for free. I read the audiobook. Um, there's 10 bonus stories in there. I, Jeff, you and I are both goal nerds. That's my phrase. You say <laughs> high achiever. I say goal nerd because we like, I mean, like you're growing a beard as a goal. Like you, you know, like you mm -hmm. got rid of social media. Like you have a hundred small goals you're doing that you probably don't even tell people about that I love. Like same, same. I, I feel like I'm amongst my people. <laughs> but so yeah, if you go to atgbook.com, share the details. I'll send you the free audio book. There's a bunch of other cool bonuses, but yeah, atgbook.com. If you pre-order before the book comes out on September 12th. So you've got like 24 hours, like let's go get the free audio books. That's the, I don't know about you. I love an audio book. I love it when there's extra content. I love that I can drive and listen. I love that I can, you know, walk and listen or, or, you know, put away laundry and listen. So we thought it'd be fun to give everybody the whole audio book. I love that. That's perfect. Yes, it's always good to have the the author read the book and provide bonuses there. That's perfect. Uh, so I'll make sure we have uh, links for those in the show notes this week. And uh, and John, this is great. Of course, I need you back for your next book, number ten. Uh, you've got to come back on yeah, the show. Yeah, count on it. That one. Count so, on it. Uh, I'm excited. We're for neighbors. That. We're practically neighbors. So That's right. we, uh, <laughs> this is easy to do. I love it. You're right down the street from me. Exactly. Perfect. Well, thanks again. Thanks for having me, Jeff. And for the action step this week, grab your copy of John Acuff's new book, All It Takes is a Goal. John is a prolific writer, and his books always provide an eclectic mix of humor and practical advice. If you want to take your life and work to the next level, this book can provide tremendous context and action steps to nail down your next grand goal. Links to John's book and website are on the show notes this week at jeffsanders.com slash 504. And of course, subscribe to or follow this podcast in any awesome podcast app you have right now. And that's all I've got for you here on the 5 a.m. Miracle Podcast this week. Until next time, you have the power to change your life. And the fun begins bright and early. <laughs>